it's a beautiful day that the Lord gave us to Amen. rise up and be in this house and what a privilege it is for us yeah. to be here. And that's, <clears throat> I love the springtime season. I love to see the bloom show up on the trees and the flowers starting to pop up yeah. and the grass turns green and God has a plan for all of it. He, you know, he has a plan that he feeds. The birds don't search and hoard up. You know, in the winter time, because he knows that the Lord will provide for him every day. Amen. That's the way we should treat treat the Lord. You know, He provides for us every day. If you want to rise, turn to hymnals, page one four zero. No, not one. We'll sing three, first, second, and last verse of that. <coughs> Closer than a brother. Amen. Amen. And wherever you go, Amen. whatever you do, he'll never leave you or forsake Amen. you. Amen. That's what he promises. Need to pray one for another. Pray for Jerry as he goes into Amen. his procedure Tuesday. Amen. Need to pray for Sister Carolyn. Amen. I think we all need prayer. We just Amen. need to pray Amen. one for another. Yep. I'm going to be reading in uh, Luke chapter 18. And he spake a parable unto them. To this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. We are to pray. We need to pray yes. and believe what we pray. And whatever we ask, we need to believe it. Saying there was a, in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded men. He didn't respect God or he didn't respect men. He was, he was an unjust judge. There was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of my ad adversities. This is help me against my adversities. adversaries. And he would not for a while, but after he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, 
Yet because this wood of trouble for me, I will avenge her, lest by her continually coming, she worry me. We gotta pray continuously to God. We, he said, be in an attitude of prayer of all That's time. That's the truth, amen. And we got to ask and pray and just keep praying all the time. Don't, don't forget to pray, I always pray. And the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge saith, the corrupt judges, the unjust judge. <coughs> and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear along with them. He bared with us. He hears your prayers. If, if we pray a little while, or if we pray in one accord is what we got to do. We got to be in one accord. If, if we're not in one accord, if one's out of the accord, then, then it, that's right. it's hard. It's that's hard right. for your prayers to get answered. But pray for me. Bless him, Lord. And pray for her church yes. and her church family. Father, as we come before you, Lord, we thank you for this day. What a beautiful day it is, Lord. Thank you for the singing that you already, we already sing praises to you, because there's not a friend like the lowly Amen. Jesus. He's high and mighty, and he's meek and low. Father, we just pray that you give us strength to endure the things we got to go through with in this world. But he said the world would have hated his disciples when the disciples was in the world. He said the world will hate you because they hated me first. Yes. And they did hate him. Lord, what a wonderful time it would have been if Israel would have just accepted him. And the world would have accepted him. Yeah. But Lord, we just pray that yes, you give Lord. us strength to endure and, and help us to get through this world because we know that one day we have that eternal life. Amen. Not because we deserve it but because God sent his only son down here to die and shed his precious blood. Amen, amen, amen. Be thank you, Lord. <coughs> covered with that blood and saved. <clears throat> and he, he told his disciples, he said, I go away, and if I don't go away, it's, it's expedient that I go away. If I don't go away, then I can't send the comforter. Thank you, Father, that your son came down yes, to die to shed that precious blood, and thank you for the Holy Spirit. That thank you, Lord. Yes. Yes. And help us all to be more like you each day and each night we go to you, Lord, and every time we go to you in prayer, we turn the rest of the service over to the the Sunday school teacher. Lord, give him the words that we need to hear. Father, give the pastor, the preacher, the words we need to hear, Lord, because you know he's our shepherd and we his sheep, Lord. Help us to always remember that, and we just give you praise and glory for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hope everybody's doing well this morning. We're gonna be we're gonna pick up where we left off in uh, Luke chapter eleven. the The focus of the, of the lesson had 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 three points to it. One was to discover, meaning that Jesus urges us to ask, seek, and knock. And the other was the desire of God to give the Holy Spirit the greatest possible gift. And the other one was to dedicate and to dedicate ourselves to praying daily as a vital aspect of our lives. To mean it, it's just as, as important as breathing, as our heart is beating, we are to pray. In Luke chapter 11, and we read verse 5 through 8, and we're talking about perseverance. And in 5 through 8, it says, And he said unto them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And in verse 7, it reads, and he says, And he answers from within, Don't bother me, the door has already been locked, and the children are with me in bed. I cannot give up. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though... 
he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend. At least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So he's teaching that persistent prayer helps through life's many twists and turns. It's the consistency of always going to the Lord. It's the persistence, always, always asking, always praying, always requesting, always giving thanks. That constant persistence. And God uses an illustration to underscore his point in his in teaching on God as Father. He shares with us as an example that place, place them in the scenario where Jesus asks his listeners to suppose their friend comes by at an inconvenient hour to ask a favor. How often, you know, even though God is all powerful, right? But there's not like this opportune time. We don't search for this opportune time to ask God for something or to go to God with something. There's not a specific time. It's not a Wednesday night or a Sunday morning or a Sunday evening. There's not this, this point in time when it's good to ask. I remember when Joshua was younger and, and I would be traveling and maybe he got into a little bit of trouble at school or something like that. And he would go, you know, is, is dad happy or sad? Is dad, you know, it, you know, you look for that time, you know, when, or usually as a child, you know, when's the right time to ask this thing that I need? It needs to be when they're happy, when something good is going on, then I can ask. Then it's easier for them to say yes, as opposed to talk to somebody from a, a point of frustration or anger or sadness or whatever it is, and then ask for something. That's like the worst time to do that. But there's not that time with the Father. It's always the right time. That, that's one of the things that I love about him is, is that it, there's not an incon- you don't inconvenience him. Because every time we ask, it adds purpose. Every time we ask God for something or we go to God with something, <clears throat> or we're just there to give thanks to God for something. What it does is it truly adds the purpose. It's, that is exactly why his son died on the cross for us. That is exactly why he's our God. That is exactly why he created us as his children to worship and fellowship with him and for us to worship him as our one and only God. It adds purpose to all that. Instead of just happening you know organically through life you know to truly intentionally go to him and by intentionally going to him that's the realization that we understand the gift that was given to us we truly understand that that it was truly a gift so every time we we accept that gift every time we we take up on that promise that he made to us he's going my children finally they my children understand the, the entire purpose and intent of our relationship. And in that particular parable, Jesus uh, presents quite a problem for us. He says, a friend who was a visitor of his own is unprepared to show the hospitality and so requests help for a situation, right? A friend of a friend comes to see my friend. It doesn't even really affect me. It affects my friend. And when he knocks on, the, on his neighbor's door, the person approaches the door, not, does not open the door. Instead, he sends his friend away saying he and his family have retired into, to the bed. What Jesus makes apparent is that the untimely visitor kept knocking on the door to receive a response. He kept knocking and kept asking. His friend, the neighbor, answered the door not out of obligation because he was his friend. He answered the door out of persistence because he kept knocking and he kept asking. I have a need that needs to be filled. I have a need that needs to be filled. That's why he opened the door, not out of obligation. These next verses in Luke chapter 11, verses 9 through 10. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. In verse 10, for everyone that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. 
And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Jesus then clarifies the exact focus of his teaching right here. He instructs us to keep pursuing God by asking, seeking, and knocking. Asking, seeking, and knocking. To ask is more than just the polite making of a request. Jesus is telling us to earnestly beg the Lord for what we need. To beg him for what we need. One of the things that's important also is, is, is to understand there's a difference in begging God. There's a difference when you see someone on a street corner with a sign out asking for help. There's a difference when somebody is standing in the entrance way of a store or on the street corner or on the curb, sidewalk, whatever it is, as you walk by with a cup out or a hand out asking for help. At that point in time, and many of us, we probably, many of us know people that are like that. They hit that certain point in their life. And the difference between what God is asking us to do and for what we're to go to God with begging God for is completely different than somebody with their hand out. When their hand is out, they're in desperation. And usually what happens is they, they have a loss of their dignity. Dignity. Dignity is a very important to us, right? Usually someone, when they're older, I saw that with my grandmother. We see that in the nursing home. And I knew that with my grandfather, for example, when he had his stroke. All of a sudden, he can't do for himself. He can't use the bathroom by himself, by themselves. They can't uh, take care of themselves, wash themselves, feed themselves. Do you think anyone wants to be fed? No. Not as a child? Do you think anyone wants to be fed? Do you think anybody wants to be cleaned? So what happens is there's a level of dignity that gets lost right there, and they feel defeated. That's true. God's not asking for that. He's not asking for the defeated to come. No. He's saying, just keep coming to me. And usually someone who is at their lowest point in their life, someone who's been addicted to drugs, and I've seen that where they get addicted to drugs, they steal from their own families. They steal checks. They steal and try to cash them. They steal, they steal uh, precious goods out of the house, memoirs, memorabilia, and things like that. And they hawk it and pawn it and sell it and do everything they can to get that. But again, when you think about it, they've lost their dignity. They've reached way below. They're already at zero. They have that sense of helplessness. I love the fact that we have this loving God that says, you don't have to hit that point. You don't have to be hopeless. You don't have to be, um, have that loss of dignity to come to me. But you kind of go to him with that same kind of mindset going, God, I'm begging you, dear Heavenly Father. You said if I ask and I seek that you will provide. Yes. But it doesn't have to be in a, that same sense of hopelessness. No. It doesn't have to be the last resort. God does not need to be the last resort. God actually wants them to be the first resort. No matter how, shall, how, how simple it may seem, how little the problem may be. I've seen that, for example, I tell you, it was interesting. Uh, you know, with, with work, for example, <clears throat> people bring things to me, issues, problems, things need to be corrected. And when they bring something to me, it seems to me so petty and so small. But the worst thing I can do is, is not react to it. Because in order for someone to say something, that means that it meant something to them. Or else they would never have said it at all. They would never have said it at all. And if we ignore those small things that, brought, that are brought to us because they seem too small, they seem too petty, they seem not worthy of addressing, they seem that it's beneath me. It's really not my problem. It's somebody else's problem. Somebody trusted me, and just like somebody comes to you with something all the time, somebody trusted you with something that may seem small and insignificant to you, but it's really big to them. I love the fact that the Father says that I will take every request, whether it's big or small, whether you have a a feeling of anxiety today, 
trying to walk out that door and face a world out there and there's so much stress on you and the things that you're, you feel overwhelmed with, God's going, man, I'm busy making sure this world doesn't kill itself. I'm busy saving so-and-so who's sick. I'm busy with doing all these things. God, I love the fact that God says there's nothing too small to ask for. He's that God. The God that says, I'm going to keep providing even though you haven't even asked me yet. He goes, you haven't even asked me yet? I would love to hear you ask me to help you. I would love for you to seek me. I would love for you to fall upon your knees. I would love for you to realize that I'm the provider for the problems. I'm the, I'm the fixer to the things that you're going through. I love the fact that God says that nothing's too small and you don't have to hit rock bottom to come to me. I love the fact that he, that's the kind of God that we worship. When we ask, when we search, and when we knock, it also implies the expectation of finding something. We go to him expecting something, or else we would never go to him at all. We go to him knowing, and that, that's also a treat. The fact that we go to him knowing that he has the power to fix whatever the situation is or whatever our needs are. He has the power to do that. We do have a responsibility, though, because the response, you know, we hear this many times, the response is not always the exact response we think we should receive. God, heal me. Maybe I don't get healed. But we, we need to realize also as his children that his will will be done in all these things that we <coughs> ask for. And to be confident that God willed it. And when God willed it, we don't get the outcome that we were searching for, and God willed it to be. We have to trust God that his will had a bigger purpose and bigger meaning than the exact situation, scenario, whatever I'm asking for right now. His will was bigger, and his purpose is bigger than my immediate need. Something was to be gained that's bigger than just me. We need to think about that. Because a lot of times we think about, we, we live in a world, it's about me, right? It's about me. It's about, it's about how happy I am. How much income do we make? How much time off do we get? How many possessions do we have? It's about us, us. And it's always, typically it's singular possessive. It's about me and me and what I have. But we have to think differently when we deal with God. Because even though we're going and we're asking and we're searching and we're knocking and we're begging and we're being persistent with God, even though we're doing all these things, to understand that his will will be done, to realize that the answer and the result may not be what I think the answer result should be. We have to have enough confidence and love in God and his purpose to realize, to search for the bigger meaning when, we don't, when the things don't end up exactly like we think that things should end up. We have to have enough trust in him that the purpose is bigger than me alone and to look for the bigger meaning in all these things that's been put before us. Our knocking then means stepping into the presence of the Lord so that our request can be made known to go to him. When he says... And I say unto you, ask and it will be given. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. That means we have to go there. This is not a phone call, a text, an email, a whatever posting. It's none of that stuff. We have to be present with him in order to ask these things. To fall upon our knees in prayer. That means we have to become one with him. And that's very different than asking for something from a neighbor or a friend or a church member. That's very different when we're asking because we're just asking for provisions. We're asking for someone to provide. In this case, he says, I, I have a, a friend who came to visit, and I don't have food for this visitor. Can you help me feed my friend? But for us, we got to realize it's not just about asking the neighbor. Here, when we go to God and asking and knocking and begging, that we actually have to be with him. We have to pray and to ask God, and now all of a sudden we're in the presence with him when our spirits are one with him. And that is so different than just a conversation or a handshake or a communication. 
the fact that we have to be together face to face. It's much easier to ask. I can tell you right now, in the in the in with that digital world or even the world, I tell you what, even the world of writing letters with a with a, an address and a stamp on there mm-hmm. and asking somebody for something. It's not really a good example, but my, my niece, uh, my niece, Eliana, she's uh, going on a missions trip. She's been to Romania on a missions trip. She's going to head to Tanzania, uh, down in Africa here this summer. And uh, she sent me a letter. She sent a letter says, hey, hey, Uncle David, do you, if you don't mind, would you support me at, uh, on my trip financially, there's a lot of costs involved with that. Uh, it would be great if you could support me in my trip there. And that's great. I appreciate the letter and it means a lot to me. I live whatever, four and a half, five hours away. So I had have no problem with the letter. But it's also different when you're asking someone face to face for something. Yeah. When you're asking for yourself, it's easy. Hey, do you think you can help me out over the phone? Do you think you can help me out over a text? Do you think you can do something for me over some form of communication? But it's also different when you ask someone face-to-face yeah. for something that's going to take away from you and give to me. It's very different uh, when we're face-to-face. And it's the same with God. When you think about it, to go to Him in prayer, that means I have to be in the presence of the Lord. We're, we're face-to-face spiritually. Yeah. That means I'm on my knees. I'm praying to you, Lord. To provide, I'm asking, I'm knocking, I'm seeking, and I expect to find. And we'll notice that as we ask, seek, and not, we're getting closer in a relationship with the person we're asking to help. And that's the way it is with God, to get closer to him. I have a note right here. It says just to the edge of dignity right there. That to the edge of dignity means, it, and that's why I said earlier, is he doesn't wait until we've lost our dignity, until we've lost our honor, until we, till we lose ourselves. And, we ha- and the last result is to only go to him. We don't have to be, go that way. God says just we're hard-headed, right? We don't take God with us everywhere. We don't take God with us in every situation. But a lot of times it's that that sense of desperation that would take a call upon him. And we don't have to get that close. We don't have to go to the edge of dignity before we ask God for his favor or God to provide for us in whatever our needs are. Jesus always placed emphasis on going after God and pursuing fellowship with him. Jesus did that. To always pursue God. I love the fact that Jesus set that perfect example for us. To do as I do. To pray as I pray. To approach the Father as I approach the Father. Because he was approaching the Father not as the Son. Well, yeah, maybe as the Son. But for us as children of God to approach the Father in this way. He was setting the tone. He was setting the mold or the way that we're to communicate with him. If Jesus is talking to the Father like we should be talking to the Father, then we too should be talking to the Father just like him. He's setting the example for us. Everything needed in life is found in him, as it tells us in Matthew 6.33. The outcome of such a prayer life is to live in the will of the Father who always gives us what is best for us because that accomplishes his purpose in us. His purpose in us. We have to keep constantly reminding ourselves, what is the reason that God created all of this, that God loved us that much, and why in the world would he let his son die on the cross for what? And to keep searching and be reminded of what the purpose that God intended what did he want from us? What did he want to happen? He's not there to challenge us every time. He's not there to praise us every single time. It is, there are going to be highs and lows in this relationship, in this Christian life that we live. But to realize that it, is, it accomplishes his purpose by us going to him and asking it is completely 
a cycle of life. When you think about a cycle of life, when you think about when things are born and when things die, when, when, uh, when water evaporates and goes in the sky and forms clouds and then comes down as rain and fertilizes the ground and things grow and things die and things go into the earth and things are fertile and things grow and the water evaporates. There's a cycle that goes around of, of life in general. And to think and to realize that that same cycle with God, the Father, creating the universe, creating mankind, loving mankind, giving us his son to die on the cross, and for us to keep going to him, that's where that cycle goes, so that we can go to him, so we can have eternity with him, so that others can be born and follow in those same footsteps. There's that big cycle that's going around. As a result of this ongoing seeking God through prayer, believers have what they need. I'm, you don't have to turn there, but I'm going to turn to Psalms 37 really quick. I'm going to read Psalms 37, verses 3 through 5. Actually, I'm going to start in verse 1. It says, Psalms 37, starting in verse 1, it says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the work of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. In verse 3, it reads, Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. To trust in him. That is exactly why we go to him in prayer. Because we trust him. He says, if I, because the word tells it, reads reveals to us that if we trust him and take it to him, this is that circle. It's, it's, almost, it's a spiritual circle. The way, that he, the, the way that the Lord loves us, the way that the Lord provides for us, the way that we go to him, the way that gives him the opportunity to answer us and to provide for us. So he keeps feeding us. He keeps taking care of us, and we keep going to him. That is the one, that's the relationship with him to define his purpose. That is exactly why God created us. Then you have to ask yourself, does asking, seeking, and knocking give us a blank check to ask God for whatever we want? For whatever we want. Does it really, are we allowed to ask for just anything? And does it obligate God to give it to us? Those are some of the questions I wrote down. So why, you know, if I ask for him, is he obligated to give it to us? Then we have to think back to ourselves earlier when I said, when someone asked of something that seemed so petty, but it was important to them. It was important to them for them to ask us or to tell us or make a statement. It was important to them. This is how God responds to perseverance. These next three verses in Luke chapter 11, verses 11 through 13. And we read, Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Amen. This really stood out too because, you know, when we go through Christmas, when we go through Christmas, you know, you know, there's a list. We make a list with names on it and we start filling that list out. Who are we going to get what for? What sizes are they? What do they want? And things like that. And then sooner or later, you 
kind of get through the list and you buy the things that you know that they, they've asked for or they need or want, we get through that list. And then there's a list there that's the really difficult to buy for a list. And then usually that's the last ones you buy for and typically you're running through the aisles and up and down multiple stores and weeks have gone by and then you just end up with something going, that looks like a good gift. Some, everybody can use one of these. So as long as it has some purpose in somebody's life, then obviously that would be a good gift for them. Just out of obligation to provide a gift that's wrapped, put under a tree is really difficult. You know what I really like? I like not the holiday gifts. I like the special gifts. I like that. I like the gifts that are, I, I like to shop for someone or buy for someone and buy something that really means something. The one that's, that someone is so involved in. Someone is, you know, one of the, one of the my nieces that is really into, uh, you know, into art, for example. And you find the exact uh, easel and the canvases and the paints and the special brushes, and the, the things that, and, or they're working in charcoal, or they're doing whatever they're doing, and whatever the media, and all of a sudden you just really search, and you search, and you find the one, you find the right gift, you find the right package, the right something, and you give it to someone. Or someone, I, my grandmother had just passed, she, uh, there's a very special way of, uh, it's almost a knitting slash crochet, whatever they do in the Middle East. And they use this very, very fine uh, thread. And they actually make these like doilies, for example, like they'll, there are these pieces that sit on a table and they look like they're lace. It looks like big elaborate lace and it's very intricate and takes literally months and months and months of, do, of, of creating this thing. And then, the, and then I know, like, for example, the things that the, she would make and stitch, or she's like five or six needles, and it goes to this thing. And anyway, it's beautiful, it's elaborate, it sits on the table. And there's so much love and intention, and a, a, the, so much work is being done to create this thing. And then, she, and then she washes it, and then she starches it so it stays firm and flat. You have to hold it firm and flat so it doesn't wrinkle up or anything. And then you lay, and then it lays there. And everyone, and I think it was so magnificent. It is beautiful to look at. I think the bigger thing is there's, you just know how much work and love went into creating this thing that they put there. That you love it that much more because that was the gift from the heart when you give to someone. You know, or, or when you take in, out. Uh, my mom or grand there's nothing I can give my mom or grandmother or, or a friend that you know they typically can provide for themselves and usually that's something that says that you in a card or a letter that says when you touch somebody down deep inside of them you touch them in their soul when you make comments about who they are and their character and their sacrifices and things like that when you when it means something to, to them the, inner, the deep inner meaning is that perfect gift that you're looking for. Our relationship with God, the thing is, he gave us something that was that special. When he gave us his son, it was that special gift that hit us right in the soul, in our spirit. That was what that gift was. It was that perfect gift that was created, shot for, developed, knowing that whether you know you appreciate it or need it or not, this thing is going to be so meaningful to you that the gift is there. And the gift was free. And it was given before we even knew we even needed it. The gift was given. It was that special gift. You've seen those gifts. You've given those gifts to really touch somebody's heart. Or you've written that letter or you've written that card and it really struck someone. When they read that letter, they read that card and tears, you see the tears come down their eyes. Because you touch somebody emotionally. That's the kind of gifts that I'm talking about here. When we're talking about God, it's not a general gift. It's not a, something that the last thing that you bought or just to get me by so I have something to put underneath the tree. It's not that one. It was the one. It was the one gift. It's interesting that the fact that this one gift that was created and developed by God in His Son, Jesus Christ, that one gift 
it meant so it meant so much to everyone that it affected everyone it was a gift to everyone that fit everyone there was no return lines there was no different sizes of it one size fits all is jesus christ there's nothing less is this great big magnificent gift and I think what's so heartbreaking to us as Christians in that lost and dying world out there as we tell everyone about this great gift in His Son, Jesus Christ. How often have we given something to someone and they don't appreciate it? It doesn't, our gift does not have to be money. It doesn't have to be a physical item that we bought. We bought it and we give it to them and they don't care. We bought it and we give it to them and we help them and there is no thank you. There is no appreciation for the gift. And sooner or later, you donate enough of your time, enough of your money to someone who doesn't appreciate something, guess what happens? Sooner or later, we don't, start, we don't keep giving money and time to someone who doesn't appreciate those things. And that's what's different about God. For us, for us, we will retract ourselves. For us, we will stop giving. For us, we will stop serving. Because that's how we are. If I give, I need to be appreciated. If I give, I need to be appreciated. That's just how we are. It's human beings. It's mankind. That's what we do. Yeah, I'm going to help you, and you're going to like it, or maybe you're going to reciprocate, and you're going to, give, and you're going to help me too. But the fact that God did, gave that gift and expecting nothing else but to receive the greatest gift, just all you have to do is just receive it, love it, appreciate it, pet it, feed it, hold it, let it consume you. And how many times, even as Christians, I fail God every single day. Every day I fail God. Every day I repent of my sins. Every day I try to acknowledge that He's my Lord and Savior. Every single day. But even in those failures, He's going to go, My son died on the cross for you, David. And you're still doing these silly things. You still can't get it. You still are living for yourself. You still are trying to provide for yourself. You're still trying to get through these things in your life by yourself. And without me. And I've thrown you a lifeline. And I've given you a life preserver. And I've tried to pull you through this life. I'm trying to get you through this thing. You and me together. That was what the relationship was. Right? The relationship was. We had this agreement. That when you fell on your knees. You expect, accepted me as your Lord and Savior. You said that you will take me with you. Through all your struggles. All your strife. All your celebrations. All the gifts you received. And the thanks that you need to give. You, our relationship was you and me. And yet at the same time, I love the fact that that God is not that kind of God that says, hey, I gave it to you. You didn't appreciate it. I'm not giving you any more. That's not the God that we have. And I give thanks for that. We gave, when we fell upon our knees and we received that gift, there couldn't have been a more perfect gift that was designed for each and every one of us, just for us. That one gift fit every single one of us. I can go on about this gift of Jesus Christ. I tell you what, he is a great, great God. Amen. And I give him thanks for him every single day. And I, I tell you what, I give thanks for the word of God that we can yeah. read to guide our lives here on this earth so we can be better human beings, so that we can love like he loved, so we can pray like he prayed, so we can give like he gave. And I give thanks for that. Let's bow our head in prayer and we'll pick this up next Sunday. Dear kind and precious Heavenly Father, I give you thanks for the beautiful day that you've given us. I give you thanks for those blue skies and the, the buds on the trees, dear Heavenly Father. The birds are singing, dear Heavenly Father. And I realize that it's just a beautiful creation you made here on this earth for us, dear Heavenly Father. And I give you thanks for your son to die on the cross for us, dear Heavenly Father, to realize that you had developed and provided a gift to us that, that fit every one of our needs. It fit us perfectly. It was the perfect Amen. gift. It was the one that touched us in the, in the spirit and our souls, dear Heavenly Amen. Father. And it provides for us. And, and I pray that we always carry you everywhere that we go, dear Heavenly Father, to ask, seek, knock, and knock, dear Heavenly Father, to realize that and to be persistent in our relationship with you. That means we're coming closer to you, dear Heavenly Father, every time we are, are in prayer, every time we ask you, every time we carry you with us, dear Heavenly Father. We're in the presence of the Lord and all those things that we do, dear Heavenly Father. And I pray that gives us the strength to, to be different in this world out here, dear Heavenly Father, to, to actually to, to shine different. The way that we love, the way that we care, the way that we give, dear Heavenly Father, the way that we carry you with us. There's something so different about us that stands out, especially stands out in the world in the state that it's in right now, dear Heavenly Father. 
I give, uh, I ask prayer for all those prayer requests placed at your feet. I ask for your healing touch for those who need to be yes. healed, dear Heavenly Father. Yes, I pray for Carolyn and Boyce specifically, yes. dear Heavenly Father, to touch their mind, body, dear Heavenly Father, and, and heal them and comfort them. I pray for Jerry with his procedure yes. coming up this week, dear Heavenly Father. You touch him, you, you guide the surgeon's hands and allow him to make the decisions, dear Heavenly Father, the decisions that you intend to have made, dear Heavenly Father. Yes. I pray that all of those that are lost, I, I pray you keep continue to chase them, those that are lost, dear Heavenly Father, to seek you as their Lord and their Savior. And I pray for Pastor Chapman, dear Heavenly Father, to touch his mind and spirit, dear Heavenly Father, and feed this congregation, this flock, the message that was intended for us, dear Heavenly Father. I pray that we glorify you in all that we do and also uh, ask for your blessings on the celebration this afternoon with a, with a shower for Ethan and Taylor, dear Heavenly Father, as as... As a, a new child in the Lord, as a new child is born unto us, dear Heavenly Father, we we pray that this this new child to be a shining star, a star, a, a seeker of the Lord, dear Heavenly Father, and a deliverer of God's message into this world, dear Heavenly Father. One by one, one creation at a time, dear Heavenly Father, do we expand your kingdom, dear Heavenly Father, and we share the love of Jesus Christ in a lost and dying world out there. And ask all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.